evening. I guess the red light means it's good. Yes. Good. good to see everybody here this evening. And uh, Pastor Paul Frederick, First Baptist Church of Laurel, Indiana, here for Pastor Richard Hibner, Victorious Life Baptist Church, and doing these basic Bible classes. Um, and we're continuing tonight uh, a series of lectures on the Baptist distinctives. And uh, glad for you to be here. I'll say more about that here in just a moment. Uh, but first, let's begin uh, with a word of prayer. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that you've given us. I pray that you uh, be with me as I teach, be with the students as they listen. I pray that uh, we would absorb your, absorb your word, apply it to our hearts. I pray that in everything that you've received the honor and glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, 1 Timothy chapter number 3. This is where uh, we've started the lessons so far. And this is kind of the, the springboard, if you will, to the Baptist distinctives. And in case you forgot or you weren't here for the last classes or you haven't seen the videos on YouTube for the last uh, class, several, uh, over a year ago now, a friend of mine asked me if I would, if I knew of a book about the Baptist distinctives. It was very simple. There were a lot of books that contained the Baptist distinctives, and some of them very in depth. But he was looking for something for new believers and new converts. And uh, so I, I, he had several pastors, not just me. But I said, "Well, I really don't know, unfortunately." And uh, through that, the Lord kind of used that to um, spur me into writing a book about the Baptist distinctives. It's a small book, about 70 pages, I think. It's only eight chapters, of course. Primer on the Baptist distinctives. And this class is an expansion of that. If you don't have the book, I do have some here tonight. Uh, I've left them out in my vehicle. I can go get, get them if you'd like to have the book. If not, you can go on Amazon. The book is entitled The Baptist Distinctives and Why They Matter. And... Um, uh, the whole idea between behind the book was to introduce people to what it is that we believe and teach as a Baptist church. And that's an important thing to know what it is that we believe, and I think, and how our church is organized and how it's structured. Paul says here in First Timothy, chapter number three, verse fourteen: "These things write I unto you, hoping to come unto thee shortly." But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. That's an important phrase there. That thou oughtest to behave thyself. That thou, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. There it's important that our church be structured properly according to Scripture and that we are following the doctrines that are laid out in the Scripture. So last in our last set of classes, it's been, I don't know, about a month ago or so now, uh, we, started, we started by looking at the first four of the Baptist distinctives. We used the acronym BAPTIST, B-A-P-T-I-S-T-S, -S, for those Baptist distinctives. So last time we looked at the uh, biblical authority, the autonomy of the local church, the priesthood of the believer, uh, two offices, pastor and deacon. And so... We looked at those together. Tonight, Lord willing, we're going to look at the last four. Individual soul liberty, saved and baptized church membership, two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper, and then separation of church and state. And the, the, the entire goal of these classes is to put this information out there so that we would become more uh, informed about what it is we teach and believe as Baptists and that we would hold to those doctrines, those Baptist distinctives. So we're going to start this evening. We're going to jump right in here. Some of the some of these, as we study them, take a little bit longer than others to study, and we understand that. But we want to get a good uh, picture here from the Scripture and about these different Baptist distinctives. So number first off, this is technically lesson number five, but our first lesson this evening is on individual soul liberty individual soul liberty. If you turn over with me to Romans chapter number 14, uh, this is, an, this is the, the text for individual soul liberty really in the New Testament uh, and this is where we would go most of the time when we're talking about this subject, though it's uh, enumerated to us in other places, really explained 
uh, in the greatest detail here in Romans 14. And as I was preparing these lessons, I was thinking about the, these different Baptist distinctives. They all are important, otherwise we wouldn't emphasize them. They're all Bible doctrines. After all, the first of the Baptist distinctives is biblical authority. Uh, it would not do us much good if we say we believe the Bible and then you know our doctrines and our practices come from somewhere else. Uh, but here at Individual Soul Liberty, uh, this is, um, it, especially this last half, all these, a couple of these in this last half of these lessons uh, are, are very um, misunderstood. I think Individual Soul Liberty is maybe one of the least understood or at least it's the most misapplied of the Baptist distinctives. And uh, I'll, I'll explain why I, why I think that here in just a moment. But if we get this doctrine wrong, if we get the doctrine of individual soul liberty out of whack, it, it affects uh, many areas of our lives. It will affect our ministries and ultimately it will be, cause us to be off balance as it were. You know, the Christian life is a life of balance. It's a finding uh, the balance and the, the peace that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we, we can uh, emphasize individual soul liberty to a place um, of, of you know liberalism and that sort of thing and uh, we can de-emphasize it I guess that way we also de-emphasize it where we are trying to make decisions for people but that's not what the Bible would have us to do uh, for centuries one's religion was primarily dictated by where they lived or their nationality as you study religions throughout the ancient world, you'll see this. Uh, we study the cities that Paul wrote to, Ephesus, and Corinth, and Philippi. Many of these places had temples or uh, shrines to different gods or goddesses. And we see that in those areas that the religion of that, that god, that little g god, was important, but it was unimportant in other places. And Christianity came and changed all of that. Judaism was supposed to be a light to all the world, but uh, they failed. But Christianity comes, and we are now preaching the gospel to every person, regardless of color, regardless of what country they live in. And uh, we, this is important for individual soul liberty because we believe every person needs to make a decision about if they're going to follow the Lord or not. And um, something else that I was reading and studying, this is probably... Uh, that there's many things that, of course, these together make us a Baptist, but one writer said this, this distinctive is the one that is most totally and thoroughly Baptist in nature. Uh, by that, I mean that we do not see this doctrine being taught at all or applied correctly by most groups that would call themselves Christians. So this is a very important doctrine for us to understand. I've changed the format of my outline just a little bit. I'm kind of trying to tweak everything and make it a little bit better, you know, as we go through. And hopefully, hopefully this makes a little more sense. First, we're going to look at uh, the definition. So in all three, in all four of these lessons, we'll look at the definition, the defense, and then the direction. So the first, the definition is just simply how we define that Baptist distinctive. The <laughs> definition. Now this comes from... <coughs> A website I found, uh, freesundayschoollessons.org. I don't know that much about the website, but I can tell you this lesson they had on the on the Baptist distinctives was very good, and especially this definition here. Not really anything new that I didn't know, but just the way they worded it, I liked it. They said this: every individual, whether a believer or an unbeliever, has the freedom to choose what his conscience or soul dictates is right in the religious realm. Soul liberty asks the believer to accept responsibility for his own actions, try not to force anyone else to do or believe anything contrary to his own conscience. However, this liberty is not a justification for disobeying God. The believer must still act according to the principles of Scripture and honor the doctrinal position of the Bible-believing Baptist church to which he belongs. Individual soul liberty could also, uh, that's the end of the quote there, but it could also be called uh, simply liberty, and that's probably what I'll call it throughout the rest of the lesson is liberty, just because individual soul liberty is very long. We call it Christian liberty, soul liberty, soul competency, all these things 
basically mean the same thing. And put it in its simplest terms, it, liberty means that God has given us the ability and the freedom to decide what is right or wrong and that we will stand before God alone to give an account for these decisions. And uh, we see this in salvation. We see this in service. No one can force someone to become a Christian. Uh, we can force someone to come to church, maybe, if they're a child or they're under our protectorate. Uh, we could even force them possibly to get baptized or memorize scripture or to pray a prayer. Uh, but we cannot force someone to become a Christian. And really, we can't force someone to live according to Christian principles. Outwardly, they may put on a facade of Christianity, but if we're forcing someone to do these things, then inwardly, there is no change. Inwardly, there is no difference made in their life. And that is individual soul liberty, that you and you alone have a decision to make what how to follow God, how to live for Him, and whether to live for Him or not at all. That's your decision. And so that's the basic definition of individual soul liberty. Next, we see the defense. So the question is, where do we find the, the doctrine of liberty in the Scriptures? Now, Paul mentions and even uses the word liberty several times, but really... Uh, what we would call the free will of man or the ability for us to decide whether or not to follow God is found throughout Scripture. Um, all right, even Adam and Eve had the free will uh, whether to obey or disobey God in the Garden of Eden. Of course, they chose to disobey. And uh, allowing God allowing us to have free will does not diminish his omnipotence that does not diminish his power in any way uh, or his provision but he has given us this so we can willingly choose to love him here paul uses the word liberty a couple verses excuse me first in second corinthians chapter 3 verse 17 paul says now the lord is that spirit and where the spirit of the lord is there is liberty Galatians 5.1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has, hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. As I mentioned, now we're here at Romans 14. That's why I had to turn there so we'd be there together. Uh, the best passage to understand liberty is found in Romans chapter number 14. We're going to look here at a couple different chapters in Romans for a couple of these Baptist distinctives this evening. Uh, so in Romans 14, so just so we don't have to read through the entire chapter, of course, Paul is writing to the church at Rome. He has not at this time been to Rome yet. He has not met those believers. He's heard about them. Uh, you know, he had emissaries going from place to place, and he would run into people from different places. And Rome being the, you know, the capital of the world at this time, during the Roman Empire, people were in and out quite often and knew of the church there at Rome. And so Paul writes to them, probably, uh, not probably, the, definitely the most doctrinal of the epistles, probably the most doctrinal book in all the Bible, the book of Romans. And so many great truths that we find there in this book, in this epistle. But in Romans 14, there is a dispute that is going on. And this is common for Paul to talk about the things that were happening in the church that needed to be resolved. And he, uh, of course, is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but he wants to help them and point them into a more perfect way. And in Romans 14, he deals with this dispute about holy days and ritual fasting. In a church in Rome and in many of the early churches in the New Testament, there is a mix between saved Jewish people and saved Gentiles. And so the Jewish people were raised in their religion. The Gentiles were raised whatever their religion was, paganism or no religion at all. Um, and there were, uh, of course, cultural differences between these two groups. And some of that stemmed from the fact that the Israelites, the Jewish people, had been uh, practicing Jews their entire lives. Their parents had been practicing Jews. And so um, some of the things that they did 
that were commanded of them to do as Jewish people, um, they still held in great esteem. And here in Romans 14, we see that the question for them was whether or not Christians must participate in the Israelite holy days and feast days and dietary laws. Uh, what should they do? Uh, and so some of them, we would call them the Judaizers, they would say, well, in order to be a good Christian, you have to keep all the law. Um, and uh, some of them might have been saved, some of them may not have been. They were, some of them were probably trying to work their way to heaven. Some of them were saved, no doubt, but they had a misapplication and a misunderstanding of the scripture. And so there was this contention. On the one hand, the, the Jewish believers, some were saying, no, we have to keep up with the holy days and the feasts and the dietary laws. On the other side, we have these Gentile believers, right? They've never had to live under these holy days. They've never had to live with these feast days. They've never had to live under these dietary laws. Can you imagine going into, uh, in, going into uh, uh, you know, a religion like that? Man, everything about your life would have had to change. Of course, we understand when we accept Christ, all things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. But man, they're talking about the, what they eat, the days that they fast, all these different things. And the condition became so sharp that Paul uh, wrote about it here in the inspiration of the Spirit. And I believe that Paul was uniquely qualified uh, to deal with this issue. He was, after all, raised in a very strict Jewish home. Uh, he was a member of the Sanhedrin. He had gone to one of the best uh, theological schools in Jerusalem uh, when he was a child and learned at the feet of Gamaliel, a great teacher of the law. Uh, but he was also, uh, he'd also been a Christian for several decades at this point. Uh, he was a, gen he was a, he called himself the apostle of the Gentiles. He had started churches and won people to the Lord all over uh, the Roman Empire, all over the Greek speaking world. And so he, he had a perspective of both sides of this argument. And in the middle, really the crux of the argument and what Paul brings them to is found in verses 5 through 10. So let's read that together. Uh, Romans chapter 14, verse 5. Paul says this, One man esteemeth one day above another. He's talking about the holy days or the feast days. He says, Another day esteemeth every day, or excuse me, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord. Again, here's the dietary restrictions. For he giveth God thanks. He that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Notice what Paul says here. Listen, there's some of you, you're living these holy days. Some of you think, oh, there's no need for us to live the holy days. We're not under the law anymore. We're under grace. That's how we are today, right? Has anyone in here uh, commemorated the Jewish holy days lately or the feast days? Oh, we may talk about them, but we don't really celebrate them. Anybody here under Jewish dietary law? Uh, you know, I stopped down here at the uh, the Euro place on the main drag. I've been wanting to stop there. They had the Italian beef and Italian sausage. And uh, and it was good. It was very good. If you've never been there, you ought to go. And uh, something about sausage, that, that pork sausage. And, uh, you know, I'm going to get in trouble. My, my wife made biscuits and sausage gravy last night for supper. And, and fried bacon. Uh, I don't live under, under Jewish dietary law. But Paul says, if you want to do those things, if you think it's appropriate for you to do those things, understanding that those things do not save you, understanding that those things do not make you a holier person than someone else, go for it. But don't look down on your brother who doesn't do those things because it is unnecessary for salvation or obedience to Christ. In this case, they had to decide for themselves. That's a scriptural defense. 
And then finally, the direction, number three. How does this apply? How does this principle, how does this principle apply in our own lives and our own church? Now, it is important for us, something I bring out in the book, to, it's important for us to note that liberty does not mean we can do whatever we want with no consequence. Uh, the Bible is very clear that when we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, there are things that we should do, right? We should read our Bibles, we should pray, we should be a member of a local New Testament church, we should give, we should witness, um, you know, we should abstain from the appearance of evil. Um, um, you know, there's things that we should do. It's also clear in the scripture that there are things that we should avoid. Um, alcohol, immodest dress, corrupt communication, uh, the <coughs> appearance of evil, gossip or idle words, and many other things. Um, so there, it, liberty doesn't mean that we can just do whatever we want with no consequence. We can just decide that uh, we just don't have to go to church because we are under liberty. No, that's not what liberty means. Paul, in fact, warned the church at Corinth about this very idea that because we are under liberty, because we are set free by the grace of God, that we can just do whatever we want. 1 Corinthians 8 9, he said, But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Paul says we need to be careful. Uh, we need to be careful that we're obeying the word of God, that we're not using our liberty as an occasion to disobey. We also need to be careful that the liberty that we display is not a stumbling block to someone else. It's not a hindrance to someone else's walk and to someone else's Christian life. We cannot just ignore the plain commands of Scripture and the prohibitions of Scripture and claim liberty. It doesn't work that way. But, on the other hand, we should not expect that every person, whether they're a member of our church or not, will have the same opinion on everything that we do. Right? And this also goes back, uh, this ties in together beautifully with the autonomy of the local church. We see, uh, you know, God is a God of consistency, isn't he? He's a consistent God. And so the church is autonomous. We could rightly say that an individual is autonomous as well. We have decisions to make. And a good example we use of that is that, you know, a Sunday evening service, whether we have one or not, what time we have those services, um, you know, how many songs we sing for a church service, all those things are important. Another good example I just thought of in, in my mind, as far as individual soul liberty, but we're all commanded to read the scripture. The Bible says search the scriptures daily. Uh, we're supposed to study to show ourselves approved unto God. Uh, we're, we're supposed to study the Bible, whether we're a preacher or teacher or not. We all understand this. We're all uh, mature Christians in here. We, we, we understand that, right? Uh, but so then the question is, what should you read in the Bible every day? Well, what you read and what I read may not necessarily be the same thing. I'm reading a, a Bible reading program. I don't have it in, in this Bible. I've got my study Bible at home, my devotion Bible. Uh, me and my wife and our boys are doing this, and it's uh, we read a different uh, genre of Scripture every day. Uh, so this morning we were in um, Old Testament history, First Kings. Uh, prophecy is one of them. Poetry, the Gospels, the Epistles, uh, Revelation, uh, the things to come. You know, so there's seven seven genres of scripture there and every day you're reading something different and it's it's nice because uh it's 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 good and bad there's advantages and disadvantages it's an advantageous in that you're writing reading something different a little bit different every day right three or four chapters in a different section the only problem is uh sometimes you forget what you read a week ago when you come back to this section right or like Job. We read like two chapters a day in Job. It took it seemed like a long time to get through Job. And uh, that's a hard book to go through, just a chapter or two at a time. Uh, but that's what we're doing this year. My grandfather was a pastor for many years. He read a, pro a chapter of Proverbs and a chapter of Romans every single day. And other people do it different ways. That is a matter of liberty. Should we read the Bible? Yes. But how you read the Bible is between you and the Lord. Another example I use of this and Brother Hibner 
uh, gets on to me for using this is found in Acts chapter 15. The example of Paul and Barnabas. There's a disagreement there about whether or not to allow John Mark to accompany them after he had abandoned them earlier. The contention was so sharp that they split up and they work, uh, They didn't work together ever again. And I agree. Uh, but Brother Hibner says they, these men, they let their egos get the better of them and they let this contention become something that it should not have been. But it does show us a couple things. First, it shows us that since there was no Bible verse or principle that applied directly, these men were free to make different decisions. God continued to use them. God continued to bless them even though they made different decisions. But it also shows that even great men of God, if they're not careful, will allow differences of opinion to separate them. Uh, this difference of opinion between Paul and Barnabas should not have been contentious. It should not have led to them separating from them from each other for the rest of their lives, but it did. And so it's an admonition to us to uh, be careful when we disagree with someone not to be contentious. And then uh, to conclude this section about Christian liberty, I think one of the most important things we can remember about liberty, something we covered earlier, that each and every person is going to give an account of themselves before God. Again, here in Romans chapter 10, or excuse me, Romans 14, verse number 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. You know, I think if we took this principle and really put it at the forefront of our minds, it would, it would change a lot of things probably about our lives, wouldn't it? To remember that everything, that we're going to have to stand before the holy God someday, and we're going to have to give an account for our idle words. We're going to have to give an account for those things that are done in our bodies. Now, we're saved. We're born again. We know we're going to heaven. We're not going to be sent to hell. That's not what this judgment is for, but this is whether or not we're going to receive rewards that we can then cast at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we would remember this, that the decisions we make, we're going to have to give an account for them, I think it would radically transform our lives. You know me, as a pastor of a church, it's a sobering thing to think that the decisions I make, uh, whether it's uh, you know in the Sunday school curriculum that we use, or the revivals or the special meetings that we have or the emphasis that we have or what how we handle something or the preaching or whatever it is i want to give an account of those things that's a sobering thing uh, as a father as a husband as a christian i'm going to give an account of my life and our game our lives are not a game you know it seems like too many people i'm not talking about us here tonight of course but it seems like there's a lot of people they live their lives, and they're Christians. They know the Lord. Um, they, they love the Lord, they say. But it seems like they want to live their life trying to see how much they can get away with right. and right. how much they can get, get by with. Right. And then they can claim liberty and say, oh, no, you can't judge me. Only God can judge me. That should scare us that, only, that God is going to judge us. Uh, but it should... Uh, it should Make us think before we do things, before we get into contentions over opinions, that we're going to have to give an account to our lives. We should want to live our lives in a way that is pleasing to God. And our, the only way we can do that is to live according to God's Word, to be obedient to God's Word. Okay. Now, there are, this whole thing is about liberty. There are things that are not mentioned in the Bible that we have to make decisions on as Christians. But as we make those decisions, let us ever remember that we're going to give an account to God for those things that we do. And let's try to live our lives according to God's Word. So that's our lesson on individual soul liberty. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. I have a question. This is so liberty. I was quite used to talking. I was thinking when the Bible says that we're bought for a price, we're not our own. Yeah. 
So uh, what that was telling me, even though we have liberty to live for the Lord, what about the price? So really, we don't have that much liberty. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're really oh, yeah, that's Lord, true. like you say, if you really love the Lord, you're not going to do something against the Lord. Absolutely. Understand? Yeah, you're going to do those things that please Him. Yes, sir. But we understand that inside of doing those things that please God, there's a lot of areas that just aren't mentioned in Scripture explicitly. Right. We have to make a decision. And in those areas, as long as we're not being disobedient to God's Word, um, then we have, the, we have the right to make that decision right. yes, sir. Um, as Christians, as individuals. Thank you. So very good. Anything else? All right, let's move on to the next lesson. If you take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter number 2. Acts chapter number 2. The next of the Baptist distinctives, so we've studied a biblical authority, autonomy of the local church, priesthood of believer, two offices, and uh, individual soul liberty. And now we are on the next, the, the S here, the first S, saved and baptized church membership. So Acts chapter number 2, and uh, we'll look at that here in just a moment. Um, so this idea of saved and baptized church membership, I've seen some... Uh, writers that would shorten this to just save church membership or regenerate church membership. I have no quarrel with that. Of course, the first, the, the first, you know, the first qualification for a member of the church is that they're saved. But also throughout the ages, Baptists have been fairly clear that a person had to be baptized uh, by the right mode and all of that in order to be, they had to be saved and baptized in order to be put into church membership. And I think uh, personally, I think we see that uh, fleshed out here in Acts chapter number 2. We'll look at that here in just a moment. Now, this seems like something that's very straightforward, as many of the Baptist distinctives do. And to me, you know, that's one of the beautiful things about the Bible. Yes, as you study the Scripture, there are deep things of God that people take the, their lives to study out. Uh, but also the basic principles of the Word of God if you're saved, you have the indwelling Holy Spirit who is our comforter, who is our teacher, then God, um, some of these things, the Lord, I think, just makes uh, simple for us to understand as we grow in Him. And this is one of those areas uh, for, for me, I think, that's, that's pretty straightforward. But it has been a contentious doctrine through the ages. It's been a contentious doctrine through the ages that church membership should solely consist of those who are saved and baptized. Excuse me. Uh, say, make a statement here. Every church that baptizes infants has unregenerate people as members. Say that again. Every church that baptizes infants has unregenerate people as members. Whether it's the Catholic Church, the Lutherans, Congregationalists, Methodists, Anglicans, um, if they are accepting into the membership um, infants and that kind of sort, then they are having people that are unsaved. They have no qualification that a person must be born again. They are unregenerate, unsaved. They do not have the, in, the dwelling Holy Spirit of God. And because of that, of course, with some other factors, I believe that has led to the erosion of biblical understanding and uh, the erosion of biblical policies within these groups. Just a few weeks ago, we saw the United Methodists, um, and you know, the United Methodists were known as gospel preachers and uh, people that took personal holiness very seriously. And now they've accepted into the clergy, uh, the women pastors in 1956, and now LGBTQ and all the other uh, here in the last few weeks. and. Why is that? Well, I think it's because they have unregenerate people who are members. There's no requirement of a salvation experience. And um, that's, you know, that's a big deal. It makes a lot of difference when you have people making decisions that do not know the Lord, and thus they cannot fully understand the Scripture. We can't understand the Scripture apart from the Spirit of God. God gives us a little bit of enlightenment so we can understand in order to be saved and maybe some people can understand some other parts of it but the totality of scripture doctrine of scripture we can't understand apart from the spirit 
and the Spirit gives understanding, and it causes major problems. Now, we're not at the end of the, the sessions tonight. We're going to talk about baptism, but let me give you just a little spoiler. As Baptists, we believe in believers' baptism by immersion. Amen. And so we reject any form of baptism that is not by total immersion and performed after uh, we reject baptism that's not by total immersion or baptism that's performed prior to conversion. And uh, so, uh, saved and church, saved and baptized church membership. Let's give the definition. Definition for us: Only born again believers who have been baptized by immersion are allowed into full membership of the church. Depending on the church, the right to vote, hold church office serve in various ministries it is limited to those who are full members of the church. I say, depending on the church, most churches like ours, of course, the right to vote, that's something that membership has. Holding church office, whether it's a deacon, trustee, treasurer, pastor, that sort of thing. Um, but really where we see a difference in churches is participation in ministries. Um, so, you know, at our church, uh, you, in order to be a Sunday school teacher, you have to be a member of our church. But if we're having BBS and you want to come make hot dogs for the kids and clean up the fellowship hall, we're going to let you clean up the fellowship hall, you know, right? So, <laughs> and so that's where the difference is. And take it simply, this concept is pretty straightforward. If you want to be a member of the church, you must have a clear testimony of salvation and be baptized by immersion. So that's the definition of defense. I think the clearest example of this truth is found here in Acts chapter number 2. Now we could get into that we're not going to uh, this evening when the church started. If you have questions about that, you can ask your pastor. Most people believe the church either started in Matthew chapter 16 or in Acts chapter number 2. But that's the most popular views uh, among Baptists anyway. Yes, sir. But by the end of this chapter, here in chapter verse 41, which is where we're picking it up, regardless of when you thought the church began, the church is in existence, Amen. right? So it says here, um, well, let's see, by the end of this chapter, it's evidence the first church was in operation. They had a lot to learn. Yes. They had leaders. They had members. They even had a treasury at this point. Yep. Uh, that's an important thing for a Baptist sure. church, right? Treasury. But look what it says in verse number 41 of Acts chapter 2. Now, this is after the day of Pentecost. Peter has just preached, and people heard it in their own language. Uh, several thousand people get saved. It says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Peter preached. People heard the word of God. They heard the message of salvation, and they were born again. And then it says they were baptized. Can you imagine being there on a day when 3,000 were baptized? Uh, it would be pretty interesting. You know, there's 120 uh, in the upper room at one time, disciples before this. I don't know if they had everybody, you know, every, every able-bodied person, every man. I don't know. That's one of those things where I hope, I really, we're probably not going to be that interested in it when we get to heaven because we're going to want to spend time with the Lord. But sometime in eternity, I hope that God lets us, you know, maybe put up a projector, however that works, and we get to see some of these great events in history. Hey. This is one of those times. 3,000 people get baptized in one day. Man, I think your arms would have been wore out by the time you were done. Hey. Uh, but look down to verse number 47. It says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Notice the phrase there at the, in, the, in the verse, the Lord added to the church. It goes back to what's said there in verse 41. They were added unto them. Who were they added unto in verse 41? The church. So they're added unto the church. Once they were saved and they were baptized, they were part of the church. Now, the, the church still had a lot of things to figure out. We see that throughout the book of Acts. Man, it just, even throughout the New Testament, if there's growing pains and trying to figure out, uh, you know, in Acts 6, we see the deacons and then. Uh, they'd go start other churches and ordain elders and, and all that. They didn't have everything figured out, but they were added unto the church when they were saved and when they were baptized. After, after they were saved, they were baptized. Now, uh, consider a few other things as we think about saved and baptized church membership. 
Uh, first is this. The majority of New Testament, New Testament epistles were addressed to churches and referred to the members as believers. Sure. And so they're addressed to churches. The members are believers. Paul would call them beloved or brothers and sisters yes. or fellow laborers. What is he saying here? These people are saved, right? Yes. They're born again and they're members yes. of the church. Uh, also, the meaning of the Greek word, I'm not a Greek scholar by any stretch of the imagination, but the meaning of the Greek word translated in the church is ekklesia. Yes, sir. It means a called out group dedicated to God. Right? This was not just somebody off the street. This is somebody that had gotten saved yes, sir. Uh, that was now part of the church. Uh, also, in the context of the church and uh, church membership, who is part of the church, 2 Corinthians chapter number 6, Verse number 14, Paul expressly prohibits believers and unbelievers from being joined together. Now, we use that a lot in marriage, marriage sure. counseling, talking about that sort of thing. And that's absolutely appropriate. Uh, but really, the context of that chapter is in, in regards to membership of the church. Right? People are, anyone's allowed into the church. Now, I don't think you even have to be a member of the church to be a part of this class here tonight, right? right? Anybody's allowed to come to the services of the church, but to be a member to help make decisions uh, of the church, you have to be saved and baptized. And then unity within a church is based on a common salvation experience in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 10. You hear about unity, unity, unity. We all have to get together. We all have to uh, love one another and hold hands, unity. Well, you know, unity can be bad if it's based on the sure. wrong thing. Right, um, but if it's based on our common uh, relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, then we have biblical unity. So that is the biblical defense for saved and baptized church membership. And then we get to uh, the direction, the application. And I know this is going to be one of the shorter uh, ones. I, as I mentioned, I think this is, is pretty clear in the Scripture, and there's not a lot of uh, commentary in the scripture because it's just so taken for granted that Paul would talk to the churches. They're all believers. They're all saved people. Uh, but the, the application is this. We believe that the proper thing biblically is for church members to first have a clear testimony of salvation and then to have been baptized after their conversion. And so we would say that they have had biblical baptism. We'll talk about the right candidates of baptism when we look at the two ordinances in uh, the next lesson. Um, so those that are saved and spiritual, uh, here's, here's, a, here's a principle for us. Those that are saved and spiritual rarely bring the unsaved, unspiritual people up. All right, there is power in pulling down. Sure. Um, look at Lot. He was a good upstanding young man when he lived with Abraham. Uh, but he goes to Sodom and Gomorrah, and what happens? Before long, he's sitting in the gate as one of their leaders. Uh, not much longer than that, his own sons-in-law laugh at him. He seemed as one that mocked when he tried to tell them about the judgment that was to come. Why? Uh, because of safe, it's, it's hard to pull up. It's a lot easier to pull someone sure down. Is. And as I mentioned in the introduction to this lesson, so far in history, every church that has allowed unsaved members has devolved away from biblical truth and towards worldliness and compromise. You go back just a couple hundred years in our nation's history, and we're going to talk a little bit about that history in the last distinctive, the separation of church and state. But just a couple hundred years ago, and there were there were gospel preachers and people that took holiness very seriously sure. from a lot of different groups, right? Uh, the Baptists, uh, the Congregationalists. We think of uh, Jonathan Edwards was a great Congregationalist minister. Preached that message, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, that yes. basically launched uh, the Great Awakening in yes. our nation. Yes, sir. Uh, he was a Congregationalist minister. Uh, we think about Methodism, John and Charles Wesley, and a bold stand they took uh, for holiness, uh, Presbyterianism, you know, but Billy Sunday was a Presbyterian sure. and went around and preached the gospel and preached holiness. But now look at the main denominations of all of those groups. The largest, the American Baptists, the ones that 
that got into a denominational system. That's not what we have. We believe right. in the autonomy of the local church. But they got into a denominational system. Now they're uh, theologically liberal and practically liberal. Think about the United Methodists. We mentioned just a moment ago. Uh, now uh, uh, affirming all these different things and pro-abortion and pro-transgender and all uh, Presbyterian Church um, and others all down the line, the Congregationalist churches, which most are now part of the United Church of Christ, the most liberal mainstream denomination in the United States. What happened? They allowed unsaved people to make decisions instead of people who were saved and knew the Lord. This is an important thing that our decisions be based on the Bible. And if we're going to base our decisions on the Bible, we have to have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to make those correct decisions. And uh, so that's the, the distinctive of saved and baptized church membership. Not as long as some others, but hopefully helpful. we have any, any questions, any comments about any of that? Nothing? Was it that good or was it that bad? <laughs> All right, so now we're going to take a break. That's the first two. You want to come up here, Brother Hendrick?